In the last few weeks, you might have heard about the new deep sea creature found in the waters of Antarctica. It's been described on social media as an alien or a monster lurking in the depths. This new species is called the Antarctic Strawberry Feather Star, distant relatives of sea stars and the many other star creatures in the ocean. At first glance, you might think of stars as boring, slow-moving, kind of just their organisms. But as you can see from this new discovery, they are often much more than that. Some look like biblically accurate angels. Others can snatch fish and other animals right out of the water. And more recently, it has been discovered that some can see without eyes. Today, I'm going to introduce you to them, since a few of them have been going viral recently as they are quite misunderstood. And to me, these are the animals that reminds me that we don't know shit. So it's time for another episode of What the Fuck Is This? The All-Star Edition. Let's get the general information out of the way by looking at our beloved cladogram, which represents how big groups of animals called phyla are related to each other. We humans, along with other vertebrates, belong to the phylum chordata at the bottom. And all the animals we're talking about today belong to the phylum most closely related to us, Echinodermata, the Echinoderms. This group includes some of the more well-known species like sea stars, of course, sea urchins, sea cucumbers, sand dollars. Yeah, sand dollars are animals. The name Echinoderm refers to their hard or spiny covering. It literally translates to spine skin, spiny skin. And the vast majority of Echinoderms also display five-fold radial symmetry. What the fuck does that mean? Okay, let me draw. So all animals except for like sponges display some sort of symmetry. Most are bilaterally symmetrical, meaning there's one way you can split them down the middle and have two equal mirroring halves, like us, fish, squid, uh, ants. So let's draw an ant. That can't possibly be right. Gian, don't put that part in. Somebody's gonna fucking cancel me for not knowing the anatomy of an ant. Two equal halves. Some are radially symmetrical, meaning there are many or countless ways you can split them equally down the middle, like cnidarians. Think of jellyfish or sea anemones from a bird's eye view. Anemone. Boom. Thrace and echinoderms, let's take a sea star, have five-fold radial symmetry, meaning their body features like their arms are all in multiples of five, and you can cut them in lots of different ways to have two equal halves. So, like that like that, mm -hmm. huh? pretty bizarre. Okay, erase, erase, erase. So you might be thinking, Lindsay, how is this group of animals most closely related to our group of animals? They seem very different from us. Well, aside from the obvious genetic evidence, there's a key similarity that our two groups share in common, and it has to do with the earliest, earliest stages of development. Boom, a cell. That is a product of a sperm fertilizing an egg. This teeny cell, will soon become a baby. But what does it need? Yes, more cells. So it starts to replicate and form a hollow ball of cells. Let's take a cross section like that, a little slice. Hollow ball of cells. You know what else this needs? Yes, holes, specifically a mouth and an anus. In most animals, the mouth, this is way oversimplified. The mouth develops first. They're called protostomes, which means mouth first. But in some animals, the anus develops first. These are deuterostomes, which means mouth second. We chordates, and echinoderms are deuterostomes. The development of the anus is what bonds the two groups together. You know what that means? We are more closely related to an urchin than we are to the intelligent octopus. We are more closely related to a sea lily, which I'll get to, than an ant. And this ancient relationship traces its origins back hundreds of millions of years to the development of a whole race. So the echinoderms are a pretty diverse group. I had mentioned sea star, sea urchins, sea cucumbers, sea lilies, sand dollars, etc. Today we're gonna be focusing on the stars because stars are cool. Also, I don't know any urchins currently going viral on social media. So let's start off with the elephant in the room, feather stars, specifically the newly discovered Antarctic strawberry feather star that is scaring the shit out of millions of people because it looks like a face hugger. Well, in life, feather stars look like this. Stunning, dare I say mesmerizing. They look like a clump of feathers form sentience and watch over the ocean floor like a deity. They are majestic as fuck. These biblically, biblically, <laughs> these biblically, bib, biblically accurate angels belong to the class Crinoidea, the crinoids, a group that consists of two bills, the free swimming feather stars that move around and swim around all cool, and the stalked sea lilies that are sessile attached to the substrate. They look like a plant. Feather stars are also attached like sea lilies when they're juveniles, but then pop off and become their own as an adult. And they do so in the most majestic way possible, keeping up with their five-fold symmetry, moving through the water, regardless of how many arms they have, which is up to 150 in some species. They use these arms to swim, as you can see, but they also crawl around on the sea floor using leg-like extensions called sira for short distances. And luckily, since they have so many arms, if they lose one, they can just grow back. It's no big deal. That's actually true for all the animals we're talking about today. So just keep that in mind. These bitches are all about regeneration. And as you would expect from such majestic creatures, they also feed 
in the most majestic way possible. They do something called marine passive suspension feeding, where they just eat the little particles floating around in the water around, them, like diatoms, invertebrate larvae, and little tiny crustaceans. They just let it happen. They don't even produce a current that pulls particles in, like filter feeders. They just rely on the natural movement of the water to bring food to them. Absolutely sublime. While they seem like creatures that would transcend the fossil record, they're actually more abundant in the fossil record than they are today. There have been over 5,000 fossil species of crinoids described since the Ordovician period about 480 million years ago. Mostly stocked builds, by the way, compared to about 550 species alive today. Say the line, Bart. That we know of. Yeah! And some of the earlier species could apparently get much bigger, like 40 feet long. A lot of shady sources that pop up online at first will give 40 meters as the largest crinoid ever found, which translates to like 130 feet. But it seems like it was a typo that was copied and pasted to different websites, just so you know. 130 feet is not verified at all. And I think it would be talked about a lot more if it was actually 130 feet, because that's fucking huge. That is bigger than a blue whip, bigger than Perusetus. But 40 feet is still really big for a crinoid. So when it comes to the strawberry feather star, it's important to remember that what you're looking at is barely a picture of a feather star. It's really just a picture of a decrepit carcass pulled up from the bottom of the ocean. And I would argue that any picture of a carcass pulled up from the bottom of the ocean is horrible to look at, especially if what you're looking at is considered a new species. Like, what the fuck do you mean? Yuck. I know it's hypocritical of me to say, considering the things I've said about the blobfish in the past, but I at least acknowledge it. I'm growing. That's gross. Also, even though the strawberry feather star is technically a new species, it's not in the way that the clickbait websites are making it seem. You know, it's not this monstrous creature that scientists just discovered in the bottom of the Antarctic Ocean for the first time. And Arctic feather stars have been known to science for a while. It's just that they didn't know the feather stars they were looking at were more than one species. They were all grouped together as the Antarctic feather star. And then it turns out the Antarctic feather star actually represented like, I wanna say like eight species. So they named this particular one, the Antarctic strawberry feather star star because its body looks like a strawberry when you remove some of the Siri to expose it. Very cute, if you ask me. They're found at depths of up to 3,800 feet below the surface of the ocean, and they have 20 arms that can each grow to about eight inches long. Just a little guy hanging out. That's all this is. The next animal in our lineup is also found in the water surrounding Antarctica. Lots of cool stars over there. And it belongs to the more basic or modest sea star group, Asteroidea. Yeah the asteroids. You can call sea stars asteroids. That is not only correct, it is also extremely scientific. At first glance, you might think sea stars are just basic five-arm background noise, as thrilling as an anchovy or a washed-up shell on the beach. Immobile, non-sentient Hollywood fluff. Well, the one I'm about to show you is absolutely not. This is what has been nicknamed the Antarctic Death Star. It has so many arms, up to 50, which is more than any other asteroid species that we know of. They start with the classic five, but then grow more and more as they get older. They can also get up to two feet long, which is very large for a sea star. I think they're in like the top three that we know of, but their size is not what gives them their name. This creature is a clear cut predator, able to snatch fish and crustaceans right out of the water and will eat practically anything it can get its arms around, even smaller individuals of its own species, which I know it's like, ooh, cannibalism. But let's be real. So many animals are cannibals in the right situation. You know, when shit goes south, like I get it when it's hamsters and prairie dogs that are suddenly eating their own species when they're not doing well, that's unpleasant. But predators and especially animals in the deep ocean of course they're cannibals sometimes. There's nothing down there. Of course they eat each other sometimes. So how does a sea star get around in order to actively hunt? Well, like other asteroids and some other echinoderms, like urchins and sand dollars, the Antarctic Death Star has these projections on the underside of their body called tube feet, which no, is not a foot fetish website. Tube feet are responsible for the locomotion of many echinoderms, and from our point of view, make them look like they're gliding across the ocean floor. Often the Death Star uses these tube feet to get them to an elevated point, maybe on a large cliff-like rock or a very large sponge, and extend some of their many arms up into the air waiting for prey to swim by and get snatched. And then boom, snatched up so quick they don't even know what hit them. This is the ocean's equivalent to a bear trap. These these claw-like structures called Pedicillarii, pedicillarii, which line the bottom of their arms, who grasp onto their meal, and they drag their victim under their body and feast. Boom, that's that one. I don't have anything else to say. So, next. That is a brittle star, named such because they are, you guessed it, brittle. They belong to the class Ophiroidea, along with their cousins, the basket stars, which live up to 6,000 feet below the surface of the ocean. They just look unkept, like a hairball you pull out of the shower drain. Like, no offense, they're cool for looking like that, but I've gotten a couple DMs of them recently, of people asking, like, what is this, I'm so scared. 
What? You're scared of a funnel cake? Get real. Okay, back to the Brittle Stars, because I wasn't even planning on talking about the Basket Stars, but whatever. Okay, so as you can see, Brittle Stars have a pretty simple body plan. A small, disc-shaped body, and typically five long arms. And their name's Brittle, because their arms are very losable. It's easy for them to lose their arms. For being honest, they kind of look like they're held together by scotch tape. And they might as well be. Brittle Stars can lose any or all of their arms and fully regenerate as long as they have that central disc still intact. They can even detach their arms to escape predators, which why wouldn't they? They can also asexually produce, kind of like cloning through a process called fission, using the central disc. Unlike their sea star relatives, they use those tube feet to get them walking around locomotion. They use their arms as one would expect arms to be used. They twist and coil them, dragging and pushing their bodies around. And they also use them for swimming. And fossil evidence suggests they've also been around since the early Ordovician period, like their crinoid relatives. So as you would expect from an animal that has been evolving in their own unique ways for that long, they have some pretty bizarre traits. One of which made me question everything when I found out about it a few months ago. One species of brittle star named Ophiacoma wendii has been determined to be able to see without eyes, something called extraocular vision. And I don't mean just able to sense light, like most animals, eyes or not, can do that. I mean they're able to produce some sort of image using structures that are found all over their body that are not eyes. Let me break it down. I don't wanna keep saying their species name, so let's just call them Wendy. Wendy is a brittle star that is found in the Caribbean Sea, in coral reefs. Lots of bright light, but there's a lot of stuff going on. It's very complex and crowded, so, you know, bright spots, dark spots, all different types of shit. What was initially interesting about Wendy and what made scientists perk their ears up about them over 30 years ago is that they change color depending on the time of day. So during the day, they're this deep shade of red or like maroon and at night, they're a shade of beige. So they're covered in these cells called chromatophores that allow them to change color, just like we've talked about with cephalopods and other animals like some amphibians, reptiles, fish, etc. Then more recently, they discovered that during the day when they're that nice shade of maroon, they're able to get around really well like as if they have eyes, as if they know what's going on. Like they can rapidly go to the nearest shelter, which is a pretty efficient behavior for an animal with no eyes. But then at night when they're beige, they can't see shit, huh? And also a close relative of Wendy, Ophiacoma pumila, pumila, let's call them Pamela, are very similar to Wendy in their build, but are beige all the time and don't scurry about in search of shelter. They kind of just bury themselves where they are to achieve dark. In other words, they can't see shit. They can only sense light versus no light. So it must be something about the maroon the chromatophores. So in 2020, researchers decided to get to the bottom of this, conducting different visual experiments on both Wendy and Pamela. Both species are covered in photoreceptors, cells that allow them to sense light, and they're covered all over their body. But they can't sense the direction that the light is coming from, it's just light versus no light, which is as far as the system goes for Pamela. Turns out for Wendy, when the chromatophores are deployed during the day, they narrow the field of vision of the photoreceptors. I don't know if this is a good analogy, but I kind of imagine it like a hose. You know, you can like put your finger over a really big part of the hose and the water will go in one specific direction, in a more narrow direction. That's kind of how I imagine the chromatophores work for the photoreceptors. They kind of like squeeze them into only taking light from one direction. And then combined with the rest of the photoreceptor chromatophore combos all over their body, they create an image. What exactly that image looks like, who fucking knows? We can only begin to imagine because that shit is unlike anything we are ever possibly familiar with. The researchers in this study think that this visual system produced by the chromatophore combination is an exaptation, which is a trait that takes on a function different from its original function. In other words, it originally evolved for one reason and just so happened to serve another function. Like feathers on birds originally evolved to keep them warm, but then eventually assisted in flight and mating displays. And in this case, maybe the chromatophores initially evolved to help them camouflage, predator avoidance, similar to octopuses and other animals with chromatophores, but just so happen to make an impact on the existing photoreceptor network by pushing into it. Regardless, it's discoveries like these that remind us that there is always more to learn. Humans are inherently biased and we naturally interpret the world based on our own lived experience and perspective. Historically, we thought to look for structures that are similar to ours as evidence of shared traits. And we assume animals with those shared traits are more closely related to us. But clearly nature is much more complex than that. To think that a statement as seemingly straightforward as in order to see an animal must have eyes can be proven wrong is fucking crazy. Okay, it's nuts. I think depending on your perspective, this can kind of be a scary thought that there are animals with traits that we don't even know to look for yet. Like what else do we not know about? But I think it's pretty cool. It means the study of biology and science as a whole will never be Finish. Even the craziest ideas can be put to the test and the world will always surprise us. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss my next long form video on Homo floresiensis, also known as the Hobbit people. You can keep up with my short form content on TikTok and Instagram. Check out my Patreon for live streams and our Discord server. And for now, stay curious. The world has a lot for us to learn. See ya.